going to be a light. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice little comfort break. I'm Stacey Croft. I'm an analytics manager at the Strategy Unit, and I have the wonderful pleasure of introducing this afternoon's wonderful lightning talks. Um, so we'll be with you till about half past three this afternoon. I'll be doing my best to keep this. I'm not sure. So, yeah. oh, oh, I think Stacey just, uh, uh, yeah, was reconnected. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, hi, it's me again. <laughs> uh, I think while Stacey, uh, yes, please let me know if you can hear me and see me. Uh, you still can hear that, an echo. Oh my God. Okay. Um, hmm. What about now? I can see Sebastian can hear me. Can you hear echo though? Okay, brilliant. So I think Stacey is reconnecting now. So I will uh, take on her job then, and I will uh, introduce Lisa Cummins, our first speaker, who is going to talk to us about... Okay, uh, it looks like we have some, uh, yeah, 50-50. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, yes, uh, so people who hear echo, it might happen if you have, uh, uh, if you Windows open, sorry, yes, if you Windows on your browser, so it might be that you uh, move from Crowdcast to Crowdcast and you have a few of them open, so make sure you have only one tab. And uh, uh, so once again, uh, sorry about this interruption. I'm introducing Lisa Cummins, who is a financial strategy analyst from Wealth of Forest. Now just people, yeah, just testing how well I know all these British places. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about uh, Sankey graphs and she will be visualizing a uh, primary care um, model, model for the coronavirus outbreak. Um, so over to you, Lisa. My Chrome has crashed. Oh no! Like oh, no. there, there was some time. There, there, there was some time to sort it, so we can invite Sebastian first. Oh yeah, I think Liz wants to sort her crowdcast. Oh, oh dear. Um, so Liz, shall I invite Sebastian then? Yes. Okay. Attempt number three. Hi, everyone again. <laughs> now, um, I, I, my pleasure to invite you, Sebastian, from uh, uh, Health Foundation to talk about his package uh, while Lisa is sorting your connection. Fingers crossed. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen so you can see my slides. Uh, can I just check that everything's fine? Yes, I can, I can see it and so can everyone else, I think, in the chat. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so thanks for joining me for this lightning talk. I'll be talking to you about Monster, which is a package that we developed at the Health Foundation that is all about uh, making your life easier by making ONS tables readable. So I can't take credit for the name or for the logo, but um, hopefully next time you're working with ONS data, you'll remember that this package exists. So um, before I get started, just to give a bit of context on how this came about. So back in March, when the, the pandemic properly started in the UK, uh, our work at the Health Foundation became a lot more reactive and fast-paced. Uh, and we had to work with data sets that were being released very frequently uh, and data that we'd never seen before. So at that time, we realized that we needed a tool that would allow us to build data pipelines in a kind of really fast and user-friendly way. So I'll just get started with um, the first question, which is, 
what open data does the ONS publish and why would I want it? So um, I can't go through all of the data they have in, in the five minutes I have today, but um, just to say a lot of the figures that you see reported in the news today, uh, for example, on the latest numbers of COVID deaths uh, are actually coming from these ONS tables. Um, a really important use of their data as well is the population figures that they release. Um, these are released at the, by age, by sex, and by small area as well. So if you were trying to compute the rate of a condition, like let's say diabetes in somewhere like um, Northwest London, you, you're going to scrape your health records to determine the number of cases, but most likely you're going to need the ONS data on population numbers to feed into that denominator. So this data really is very useful. Um, other data sets that might be relevant to you, depending on your research, uh, could be on uh, jobs, unemployment, uh, income, or house prices, um, if, if you're into that as well. Um, a word on the geography of this data, it's, it's usually by region uh, or local authority, sometimes uh, by small areas as well. Uh, this takes me to the next question, which is, um, so how do I get my hands on this data? And the first option is something that I think we've all done before, where you go to the ONS website, um, you find the data that you need, you end up downloading a bunch of CSVs, uh, you save them in your drive, you have to clean them individually. Uh, sometimes each file comes in a different format, so you have to skip lines or skip columns. And um, it's just not really in a format that's ready to be used uh, from the moment you download it. And when you're working with data that is getting refreshed very frequently, uh, you can see how this um, is an ideal and it also makes you more likely to make mistakes. So the alternative to doing that is using something like the monster package. Uh, what this does is that you, just by using the package, you can query the ONS API to browse all of the data that they have and import a ready for use data set into your workspace. Um, we think that this is also a much more open way of working because just by sharing your code, you're allowing others to reproduce your findings without also having to uh, send or upload any attachments. So um, before I run out of time, uh, just a quick overview of how the package works. So uh, there's only really four uh, functions in the package that you need to worry about. And the first three are there for you to browse what data is available um, in the ONS API. So for example, I may be interested in weekly deaths by region. And let's say that I'm interested in the COVID-19 edition uh, of that data set. Um, and then in terms of versions, uh, I'm probably interested in the latest one, but the API and the package also allows you to download uh, older versions of that data. So once you've selected the data set, the edition, and the version, uh, you can use our ONS download function to um, uh, extract that data, save it locally, and then uh, you're free to get started with your analysis. Um, just conscious of time. So You've got I'll... two minutes remaining. Yep. Uh, I'm just gonna finish by plugging our Health Foundation GitHub page. Um, if you go on the Health Foundation Analytics Lab slash monster page, uh, you'll find some resources that will help you get started with the package. Um, and also I suggest that um, if you're interested, you can look at a vignette that we recently published that has a step-by-step -step example on uh, how to use the monster package to compute uh, mortality rates. So um, yeah, I think time is about to be up. Um, so thank you for listening. And um, uh, if there's time, time for questions, I'm happy to, to take any. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. Yeah, we do have time for questions. Um, I'll just check, I can't see 
anyone asking a question in the chat looks really interesting and useful package though Sebastian so I've got a question how does it handle you know when ONS make corrections when they've found mistakes uh so that would be um you would download the latest edition and usually that would be the corrected edition um so any data that's refreshed on the website is also refreshed on the api we've got a request from david lewis in the chat um whether you could give us a quick example of it working in r i don't know whether that's possible we've got a couple of minutes um i'm not sure i can i can demo it right now um that might be a bit of a yeah and and also uh just to flag the api was down <laughs> this week <laughs> but it, it should be working now so uh, <laughs> uh i i suggest you look at the vignette um which which will show you kind of a, a really easy way um to get it to work and and the vignette yeah. uses two different sources of ons data it uses the the number of deaths from one data set and the population numbers from another one so um, um yeah that's a, a kind of a good learning tool had a um a quick question in the the chat um let's see it is is there a way to link nhs organizational data from the ods service uh I think that um, so, so the package right now only works for data from the ONS API. If the um, if the NHS had something similar, then uh, I'm sure that's something that could be developed. I think we might have time for one more final question because um, it's being asked. Um, Georgius says. Thank you, Sebastian. Could you briefly say how you can use this for population projections? Uh, sure. So um, the, the package doesn't make projections per se, but it can give you the latest projections made by the ONS uh, of population numbers by um, age and, and sex and region. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, yeah. for your talk, Sebastian. We're going to move on now to our next speaker um i think we're going to backtrack and try and get lisa on the stage brilliant uh thanks everyone thank you very much bye bye wonderful thanks Daisy. Hi, lisa. Hi. are we working now both of us <laughs> hopefully so i'm going to try sharing my screen again the last time we tried right. sharing, it crashed. Give it a go. but um yeah let's see cool Oh, we'll so catch the skin in the chat there. Okay. Cute. So can <laughs> you see saying. my presentation? That is great. Yes, I can see it. And um, I'll I'll start our timer and you've got seven minutes to talk and then a couple of minutes for questions afterwards. And I'll pop on as unrudely as possible as, on, as possible <laughs> virtual software to just like tell you when you've got two minutes left. Perfect. Thanks. All right. I'm kind of of time though. I definitely went over when I was practicing this. Um, so just briefly, my name is Lisa Cummins and I'm a senior analyst working across Northeast London. Um, I'm going to go through uh, how I made Sankey graphs to visualize change in triage and point process primary care. So briefly touch on the task and the output. And I'll probably spend most of the time kind of talking about my experience as somebody who was pretty new to OR when they, they did this analysis. So the aim was to understand how the triage and appointment process had changed before and during the initial outbreak of the coronavirus in a large GP practice in Tower Hamlets. So this kind of uh, captures the, that triage and appointment process. For the purposes of this analysis, I was just interested in kind of the second half highlighted here in, um, in pink, which is the point at which um, the patient would require at least some level of clinical input. So to do this, I created a Sankey graph using the Network D3 package, um, which allowed me to show the flow of patients through the through the um, through the the process. And um, so here, this slide just kind of captures um, a quick kind of overview of the difference between November and April. I won't go into it in too much detail, but I'll kind of switch to April and 
give uh, a description of what the plot shows. So basically, as I mentioned already, it captures how patients going to move through that appointment process. So if we look here at this kind of first stage, it's if a patient kind of enters the um, process as, as their first contact being a triage type of appointment, they can, um, for example, may move, they may have their appointment resolved pretty much straight away. This could be, for example, if somebody has a common cold and the doctor decides actually it doesn't make sense for us to bring them in, we can just give them some advice and recommend they stay home. If they might need some further um, follow-up, perhaps to identify what their care might need, they may actually move on to kind of a next contact, which would be kind of a follow-up triage uh, process, uh, follow-up triage step in the process. And then from there, they may even move on and actually have a telephone follow-up consultation, or they may actually have their uh, concern resolved. Um, what we can see is the majority of, um, of appointments tend to be resolved after that second or third contact. There are some, however, that re do require kind of more, um, more, input, more input or more contacts with the practice. The key findings compared to November were uh, as we would imagine, more phone consultations, more e-consults, um, an increase actually in triage, um, a reduction in face-to-face -face contacts, and also a redu reduction in the conversion rate from triage to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, just to briefly on terminology, so um, the in a psyche plot, you've got these coloured bars which are called nodes, and these nodes kind of represent um, that quantity of activity captured by that particular part of the um, appointment. So you have a source node, which is your first contact and also your, your target nodes. So it, you're kind of trying to capture that link between your source and your target. Um, your target nodes do turn into source nodes um, when you move to that kind of next stage in the process. And this is important when you're um, try to restructure your data in the right format so that you can actually uh, generate the graphs. Um, creating graph, psyche graphs using this package is actually pretty easy, but that's so long as you know how to use OR. Um, this tweet is from one that I kind of made in mid-May, which captured kind of whereabouts I was in terms of like doing this analysis. So I come overcome those initial stages where you feel like your head's about to explode but you're kind of starting to build some confidence and um, actually understanding what your errors you're making and being able to fix them. So I felt that was kind of like a, a big massive stepping stone in terms of my learning. Um, now I'm going to turn on to the challenges. Um, the main one particularly was around getting the data in the required format. So what I had was contact level data, so one row per contact with no appointment ID. But what I needed was like a list of each of those source and target combinations along the process with the frequency of each of those combinations. Um, so it took quite a lot of work, quite a lot of work to get there, and I'll go through that briefly in a minute. Um, and the other main challenges were around defining appointment groups, creating appointment IDs, and also formatting the graphs. Two minutes left, Lisa. Okay, Q, I'll quickly run through the rest of the slides. So around defining uh, contact groups, we had I had a list of 75 different slot types, worked with the clinical lead to define um, these into contact groups. Um, so there's kind of like six, six different kind of uh, sensible groups, and that allowed us to create um, the psyche graph in kind of a condensed version, so you didn't have, so it wasn't like terribly unwieldy. And in terms of the appointment ID, as I already mentioned, I had to basically convert my contact data into an appointment level data. Um, again, work, working with the clinical lead to find what we, based on the data and based on his clinical expertise, what a sensible kind of appointment group would look like. This is an example of the script I used to generate those appointment IDs and contact IDs. I was pretty proud of my efforts to get it to this point. Um, I can post it so people can kind of see the step-by-step -step process. There's probably still room for improvement, but I think if somebody was new to OR, I made a pretty good effort at this. The next challenge was around restructuring the data. 
Um, but once I had my appointment ID, it meant uh, my contact ID, it was meant that it meant that I was able to do kind of a series of aggregations and pivots and um, spits and merges. Let's quickly go through this, which meant that I was eventually able to get my data to this desired uh, structure, which you need so that you can actually generate the graphs. Um, I won't go into form any too much detail. The key, key, key takeaway here was um, I had spent some time trying to teach myself how to form the graphs, but in the end, I just sought advice from one of my colleagues. He gave me some really, really helpful tips and advice and definitely helped me save time. And then the second last slide around impact and what I learned along the way. Um, the analysis actually has motivated the company who uh, own the triage and booking system who provide that for the whole of Tower Hamlets and potentially going through all the way across North East London. So they're going to incorporate Sankey Graphs into their online platform um, because it was such a useful way to visualise kind of demand and capacity uh, or capacity. Um, I also developed these skills at OR, in particular in data wrangling, um, the DPLYR package and pipes. Um, learned that it's really, really important to work collaboratively, especially with those who, who are close to the data. Um, and I guess finally learning something new is difficult, but with a little bit of perseverance, you can actually achieve a lot. So if there's any new enough people to or uh, here today, I would recommend that you be creative, try it new, different, try it different methods. Don't be afraid to make some mistakes because that was probably one of the best ways I learned. Um, and also reach out to your colleagues. Um, because if you were trying to solve something, they probably already fixed it before. And lastly, I guess this is where I am now, probably somewhere, somewhere between a four and a five, where my confidence is improving each day, but still learning for definite. Um, thanks for listening. And let me know if you have any questions. Really well done, Lisa. Thank you for that. It's really interesting talk. Um, I love seeing uh, data from primary care as well. We've got a couple of questions, so I can't let you off the hook just yet. <laughs> um, um, so one of our questions in the chat is, can they just quickly ask, how is triage different from e-consult? Um, so in this particular practice, um, it's the e-consult is actually the consul consultation a person would have with a, a GP or a nurse, but the triage process is kind of like that initial, but that kind of first point of contact where they might either contact the um, practice using the online booking system or over the phone. So it's not necessarily decided what they need next, if that kind of makes sense. We've also had somebody running a poll in the background um, about would we like Lisa to offer a tutorial of her work? And so far the answer is 100% yes, of course we really would. <laughs> Can do. <laughs> so I'm sure we can organise that with you at some point, Lisa. Yeah. Um, lovely to have you on. Um, thanks very much for taking the time to do your talk with us today. Thanks so much. And thanks to everyone. It's been really interesting to listen to everyone so far. Oh, one quick one that might be of interest to lots of people is, is there somewhere we can see the code? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just tidying it up. I'm making sure I remove any identifiers and I'll put some sample code, some sample data up as well so you can practice. Wonderful. Great. Thanks, Good. Lisa. Okay. Thanks so much. Cheers. So that was Lisa. Our, our next speaker is Richard Armstrong. He's an academic clinical fellow in anaesthetics and he's from the University Hospitals Bristol. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, meta-analysis in R, using meta to track COVID-19 outcomes. Are you with us, Richard? We've got Richard. Lovely. I am. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Thanks. So, um, same with the others. You've got seven minutes to talk, and I'll interrupt you two minutes before the end of that, as gently as I can. Brilliant. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Then, hopefully. Lovely. Right. Thanks very much. Over to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, a meta-analysis uh, that we did using R, and why I think R was a good idea to use for it. Um, so the problem we were trying to address was around this huge increasing volume of publications that were coming out about COVID-19, um, which makes it incredibly difficult for any individual to have a handle on what the latest evidence is saying and assimilating all of that body of knowledge. So what we were setting out to do 
uh, was perform a meta-analysis to try and get a point estimate answer to this question, basically. What is the intensive care unit mortality for COVID-19 patients? And traditionally, there's lots of commercial software packages for meta-analysis, um, but you can also do it in R. So these were just some of the potential problems and the solutions that we felt are offered. So we had no specific funding for this project. And as we know, R and all its packages are freely available. We needed meta-analysis functionality, and we specifically use the meta package, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a minute. We wanted to do various different types of analyses, and this meta package fortunately contains all the methods you could ever dream of wanting to use standard and advanced methods for primary and secondary analyses. We wanted to easily export our results um, so that we could publish them, and our markdown is the perfect way to do that. We wanted our research to be reproducible and transparent, and we can we can share the code of our analyses on GitHub or elsewhere so that people can engage with it. Um, and we wanted to produce plots to include in our publications. So the built-in plotting functions of both the meta package and R itself help with this. And importantly, we wanted to rerun the analyses as and when new data came to light. And obviously all you have to do is re-import your data and rerun the script once you've done it the first time. So I'm just going to whistle through some of the main kind of workhorse functions of this package that, that were used in this analysis. Uh, so the first is the meta meta prop function, which uh, performs a meta analysis of proportions. So we were looking at essentially the proportion of patients who are admitted to intensive care who either survive intensive care who or who unfortunately die in intensive care. And it's the, the function couldn't be easier to use, really. You need data in this kind of basic format. So you have all your studies, number of events, which relates to how many patients died, number of observations, which is the total number of patients included. And then this is the kind of generic form of the function for that. So you tell it where your events and observations numbers are, what your studies are called. You choose which method of meta-analysis you want to use. This is the, this is the method we used in this case. Um, various uh, operator options like about the different type of analysis you want to do and then this stop all at the end is if you want to do a subgroup analysis you can tell it what the grouping variable is so this function you can run it over and over again uh, you can build it into a function and and map over you know a load of different data tables um, and then it gives you the output of the analysis in one you know one bit of code then to present the, the results, the mainstay of uh, meta-analysis result presentation is a forest plot. Um, so meta has its own built-in forest plot function. Um, and effectively, the outputs of that first function, you just feed into the forest function. You set your labels um, and then make your plot. These are just graphical options, essentially, and graphical parameters that you can control. This is an example uh, of an object outputted from meta prop function and then this is an example of uh, one of the forest plots that we included in the paper where we've done a subgroup analysis looking at the different continents uh, and this is just to demonstrate that that the results were very similar across the globe regardless of where we were looking and then some of the kind of secondary and more detailed analyses we wanted to do this is just one example of something that meta supports which is meta regression so this allows you to look at how the outcome varied depending on covariates of your choice. Again, I've just included a kind of general form of the formula in a kind of deep layer pipeline here. You put your data in, run your meta prop as before, and then you pipe that into the meta reg function um, with a formula which basically includes the covariates that you want to use like in any other regression. And then you can pipe the result of that straight into the bubble function which produces this so-called bubble plot, uh, which in this case is demonstrating a reducing trend over time uh, in the mortality rate. And then, so those are the main parts of the yeah, meta package that we use. Thank you. Um, these are just some other generic R functions, which I found really useful for, in general, producing an academic publication. So one is R markdown. Um, I've never really engaged and used it properly before this. And this is just an example of where, you know, you put a code snippet in to represent a number from your analysis. Um, and as and when things update and things change, 
it just pipes straight through into your Word document, reduces the chance of copy and paste errors or other kinds of mistakes like that. And obviously ggplot, um, which produced some more graphics that we were able to include in the final publication. Uh, so thanks, that's just a whistle stop tour through. If you want to see the paper, uh, you can find it here in, uh, in Anesthesia. And just say thanks to my co-authors as well, Andrew Kane and, and Tim Cook. Uh, and welcome any questions, thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, can people show their appreciation in the chat for Richard? Really well done. Um, uh, not sure we've got any questions at the moment, but That's we fine. do have in the poll um, suggestions that you should, in fact, offer a tutorial on your package. I'm detecting a theme here with the polls. <laughs> um, I had good. a quick question. Um, how long did it take you to develop this, Richard? Um, the I'd I'd done it a, a bit before. Um, on another on another project, um, so it's been uh, been kind of messing around with it for for a couple of years now. Um, yeah, and I just see there's a comment there in the chat about the data and the code. The code uh, will be available on on GitHub, um, and I can circulate the details of that later on. I think. Um... I think it would be really useful for particularly for those that are looking at ways of, of publishing their work. Um, it's really yeah. useful to have that uh, help. I would, with the, I would the say text. it was with the, with the R markdown, especially. It's definitely worth the initial effort of um, of getting to grips with it. It really does. It really does streamline things. It's a lot of time. Okay. Uh, I think there is one question. Let me just check. Uh, it's come up. Could you speak a little bit more about the table forest plot hybrid and how that's made? Um, so the, I, pres I, I guess that means the forest plot where you had the graph, but also the numbers all down the side. Um, that's, that's simply that it's presenting both the numerical output of the analysis uh, on one side um, and a graphical interpretation on the other side. And all of that's configurable um, and can all, can all be changed. Can you change the colours and things like that? Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, often, often black and white is um, is a preferred, unfortunately, a preferred medium for the uh, journals. Great. Well, can people please show their appreciation for Richard in our our chat? Thanks very much for joining us today and taking Thank us you. through that. And I'm sure Mohammed might be in touch about you doing a tutorial on that <laughs> in more detail, show people how to use it and how to get to grips with that. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jo Sweeney, and she's an analyst from NHS England, NHSI, um, and she's going to be talking to us about using Office R to compile PowerPoint. Hi, Jo. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so same as the other speakers. You'll get seven minutes, and then I'll interrupt you as gently as I can when you've got two minutes left just to give you the heads up, and hopefully then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. Perfect. If people put good. questions in the ask a question box, and uh, I'm sure Mohammed might create a poll as well. <laughs> Perfect. Um, hello, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for all the other speakers. It's been really uh, informative so far. Um, who am I? I am uh, Jo McSweeney. I'm analyst in NHS England and Improvement, and I produce a lot of slide packs um, working with SUS, the secondary uses data, and the weekly activity returns data. Um, and so typically I would use Excel, SQL, and RStudio. Um, this talk is about a package that I have used to create those uh, slide packs. Um, if you have a, an updated of our markdown, you should be able to see a little PowerPoint uh, kind of section there. Unfortunately, I do not. It's uh, my um, our studio on my work laptop is a little bit uh, outdated, so I was not able to uh, create PowerPoint directly from our markdown. Apologies if this applies to you. You can switch off and have a cup of tea or what have you. Um, Office are what this does is you can produce PowerPoint slides, you can create Word documents, um, but for me it's the last one that is the one that I kind of uh, brought 
um, kind of appreciated it for, and that was its uh, reproducibility. I am thoroughly lazy. If I can automate something, I will. Um, so, for example, we had um, during the planning round, we wanted to quickly update uh, slides that um, brought in data from the uh, secondary uses um, uh, data, the weekly activity data, the new planning data, the kind of phase three requirements. And so with a press of a button in R, I was able to just kind of produce PowerPoint slides for each of the different levels. We had regional data, we had um, uh, data at SDP, strategic transformation, something like that. Apologies for not knowing that acronym. Um, and we can even, even go down to organization level. So, it's um, the packages that I used um, for this presentation, and apologies for not having my code up on GitHub just yet. I have emailed it through, but it was only this morning. Um, data from NHS R data sets. Now, this has got data from um, A&E attendances, admissions, and breaches from April 2016 up to March 2019. So it's a really kind of good couple of years worth of data. Um, I uploaded a, a lookup file that was just really kind of um, to be able to translate the organisation codes into the SCP and regionals. Um, so this was uh, via two packages to read in the information and read out the information. Then it was a reshaping the data with um, a couple of packages uh, there, of which Tidyverse is probably my go-to uh, package and producing slides. I'm going to focus on the last, uh, the sections that use the last uh, couple of packages. What was the, the kind of the process? So the NHSR data sets package was the um, kind of where the data came from. Organisational lookup was just to transfer the organisation codes, for example, RDU, R0A into the uh, various regions. I uploaded an NHS England and Improvement PowerPoint template. However, I do have um, materials that you can just use the PowerPoint that is automatically within the uh, Office R package. Wrangling in R, so that kind of basically took the um, in, um, information from NHS R uh, data sets and two functions were involved in this it's one function created the charts as i wanted them so that's with the colors the fonts the layout and um, the minimal back screens and uh, the other one was to automate the text and so have a function for text that brought out what was the maximum um, attendances or what was the maximum admissions for the particular organization it's the powerpoint slides that I'm really going to be um, kind of looking at um, during this session. So it's like kind of loading the PowerPoint template and the read PPTX uh, function was absolutely brilliant for me. I just read in um, the PowerPoint from my file path. However, if you leave the um, inside closed, you, it just loads the standard PowerPoint in Office R. Uh, when you run that, you will see two little uh, screens in your global environment, and it's a list of zero because there are no slides added at the moment. So just to uh, show what my PowerPoint template looked like, it was quite literally just like that. So you can click to add your first slide. Choosing your layout. Um, one of the things that um, you can normally do in PowerPoints is to choose what type of layout. Unfortunately, with my um, template, I was very, very limited. The layouts underscore summary will be able to show you what type of layouts are available for your particular PowerPoint. I only had um, a title slide layout and a title and content. However, there are also um, within the standard PowerPoint um, template, there are lots of different options that you can um, have. But the layouts underscore summary was absolutely brilliant for me just to choose where it, um, what options I had. Um, where can you, sorry. Two minutes to go. Uh, in terms of where you put your object, all of the, those different options at the bottom in the body, in the title, in the central. In terms of uh, running it, you've got two little things. Add underscore slide can add the slide to that PowerPoint using these uh, layouts and master themes that you got from layout summary. You can add a text and you can put it in the title. You can add text and you can put it in the subtitle to form something like that title with your subtitle. Adding a graph, 
well, I've got my function line graph. This quite literally brought my information in and put it in the um, form that I wanted. So again, add the slide to the PowerPoint that I've started in that particular layout form. And instead of the value being a text, it was actually my um, function. So my function then put in Northeastern Yorkshire and the attendance. Full size really shows it as a nice full size slide. That might not necessarily be quite what people want. So therefore, with here, we've got um, adding the slide as, not as before. Um, I've popped a title on in the title section and then the line chart then, I've told it where to put it. One from the left, 2.5 from the top to form something a little bit like that. Little bit more uh, going on multiple charts, I've used the grid.arrange function. So this puts the three graphs one under the other. The DML package, um, DML function was had to be used because of the new version of um, RVG, which is the graphics. Um, and the N row identifies those number of rows. Adding the multiple charts, as well as you can add in text. So my um, function text brought out the maximum um, attendances for Northeast and Yorkshire, maximum breaches and maximum attendances. So with those three graphs and the uh, text that brought out the maximum number, um, it kind of looked like this. One of the things that you can put, uh, that I did put around it was the comma um, uh, function in the scales package and then I used uh, Lubridate to be able to do the month name to um, show it as not some uh, random date. The um, uh, quite literally showing from this is Northeast and Yorkshire region I quite literally just swapped all of the NEY for Airedale and you can do exactly the same thing the rep um, reproducibility um, nature absolutely amazing. Um, what else Lots of other things you can use. You can um, create and format the tables. You can put images in. Uh, David Grohl's PowerPoint generation um, page is absolutely incredible. Um, and yes, it's like kind of we've got lots of Tableau um, dashboards and much more interactive. However, what I do is um, it's the um, customers that I work with do like the PowerPoint slides. So it was a really super easy way that I could just hit go and have exactly the same slides for regions. STPs and organizations. Cool. Um, Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, have we got any questions from the audience at all? Um, I was wondering, Joe, how much time do you think this has saved you? Um, well, it's instead of uh, kind of going from Excel copy, paste chart, copy, paste chart, um, including, I hate copying and pasting, so it's, I will do anything to save me that. Um, I quite literally just press, kind of go, make sure the um, input files are all where I need them to be, or look at the um, kind of SQL um, data, um, if the data is in a SQL database. Um, it's probably every time it's a good, well, slide pack of 18 slides, copying and pasting, half an hour to 45 minutes but in terms of the um accuracy so much happier with it it's i know that i can press go and it will all go there as opposed to being um um i don't know kind of um, interrupted by a ping and being like oh did i copy that did i not copy that um so i think that's that, that's for me what i love about our studio really useful uh tool and uh, way to put together a powerpoint isn't it um i've got a question in the uh questions and answers section that says um hi thanks for the talk compared to slides made with w slash xaragam sorry if i pronounced that completely wrong <laughs> which are the advantages and shortages of this approach um it's for me i've never created slides using that package so it's um i think it was something that i did go down but um when i it was possibly something that I initially had to um, not use because of the versions of my R Studio. So it's for, um, for me, this was the thing that fitted in with the versions, the packages, etc. that were required. I knew that I could run this on my work work laptop. Okay, Sorry. can everyone show their appreciation for Joe? Thank you so much for the talk. That's really useful. I'm sure other people will be looking at that as a, a method of doing their PowerPoints. 
Um, next up, we've got Ben Alcock, who's a data scientist for an NHS filed coast CCGs. Um, and they're going to be talking to us about uh, the geographical outbreak detection of COVID-19. Have we got Ben on our line? Hi, Ben. Great. Um, so you've got seven minutes to talk and I will gently interrupt you when you've got two minutes left, just so okay. that we've got some time for questions at the end. Over to you. Cool. Uh, so hopefully you can see the slides. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm just going to talk through some of the stuff we've done for the geographical outbreak detection um, for coronavirus in, this is for Lancashire, Blackpool and Blackpool with Darwin. Um, and so this is uh, myself and my boss, John T. Peters, but there's also been significant help with this from colleagues in public health um, for the three unitary authorities or the three big authorities. Um, so to start off with, uh, we get postcode level data from public health England. They have access to their Power BI dashboard so that we can see exactly where the cases are happening. And we can also see um, some, uh, some things like the age of the people who were testing positive, ethnicity, um, that kind of thing. So here's a little um, example of a dashboard we made, um, probably as everyone else has, using that information where you can filter on specific dates. You can choose like an age range, so there are chosen um, just retired age, and you can see where they're happening on the map, change the dates, map will update, um, and so on. So that's really useful if you're trying to do really targeted campaigns around postcodes. Uh, but the problem is it doesn't contain any information about the underlying population. So you might get 20 cases in an area, but you might have a thousand people living in a very, like in the close, in the centre of a city, it might be very dense. Uh, whereas if you get the same 20 people in the countryside, that's very, that's significant, or well, much more significant. Um, so the obvious way to try and deal with this is to look at crude rates. Um, so we used R, um, we used Plumber at R. Um, so the front end, you can click uh, crude rate, here's a little video showing this. Um, and you can choose your whichever level you want to see, so LSOA, MSOA, uh, up to upper tier authority. And we use the package SF, uh, which is really good for doing kind of geographical stuff. And so using that, you can quite quickly just uh, choose your date range and look at the uh, the rates that are coming through within the range. So there's some examples of that's gone, but there were some examples of uh, the rates coming through. That's also really good, but it, it can be quite noisy when you're looking at. Um, specific rates because you could have, especially if you're looking at low level, uh, an LSOA, you could have five cases, which would pull it out as a massively high um, rate per 100,000 population. Uh, the one next to it might have none, one next to it might have two, uh, so it can be really patchy. Um, you can fix that by going to a higher level, but then you don't really get that granularity. You can't really see where the cases are happening. Um, so the first way we tried to deal with this was by using something called a, a spatiotemporal scan statistic. Um, so this is a statistical technique, um, and there's an R package for it called scan statistics, um, where you form geographical zone, well, the package forms zones. So this GIF is showing each frame is a different zone being formed. Um, so it's the red area is the center, and then you build up lots of different zones by just grouping together, clustering the nearest neighbors. Uh, so you run a we run a Poisson model to estimate how many cases you would expect within the area. Um, and then we compare that basically to the actual number of cases. And then you go back and you compare every single area. How many cases did you see? How many did you expect? Uh, you run this uh, 10,000 times uh, to build up some kind of confidence. And then you, you have this order and you can say this area is the most significantly different um, to everywhere else. And so that gets something like this uh, in the map. Uh, so you can see it's a lot less noisy um, than the just crude rates. This is LSOA level and you can see it's really pulling out uh, bright spots. So if you were in the council in Preston, you might think you want to target something in the northeast for this time range. If you're in Lancaster, definitely in the south, not the north, um, and so on. Um, but that is, so that's pretty useful. Uh, but the problem with this, again, is that it's confined to predefined boundaries. Um, so you're looking at LSOAs or upwards, MSOAs, whatever. Um, but obviously cases don't really happen confined to boundaries. You're not going to get one person who will infect everybody within the LSOA and ignore the ones to the side. Um, it will be maybe around a primary school, you'll get lots of people in the primary school, so within the region. So if the primary school is on the edge of an LSOA, that can be quite hard to deal with. So the way to fix this um, was by using something called an isochrone. Uh, so an isochrone is an area of equal travel time from a point. 
Um, so you take a point on a map, and so here's an example. I don't know where this is, but this could be like one minute drive away, two minutes drive away, three minutes drive away, and four minutes drive away. Um, so the shaded regions, that's what that's showing. So if you use isochrones, uh, you could just choose points on a map, build isochrones around the points, uh, say 10 minutes walk from a point, and just count up the number of cases within the point and divide it by the size of the, uh, the isochrone. Uh, so you could use this kind of method to locate uh, clusters of outbreaks and see kind of the local center because uh, it should highlight where they're coming from. About two minutes left then. Yeah. Um, so obviously Lancashire is quite big. If you were doing this even bigger, it would be just impractical to do a grid search. You can't just choose every single last two longest you pair and you can't, you can't add in the kind of walking time. Uh, so to fix this, we used uh, something called a genetic algorithm. And this is using our package called GA. Uh, so this will choose points on a map um, and it will quite, quite quickly and quite efficiently um, hone in on areas where uh, the highest numbers of cases are happening. So here the, the GIF is showing an example, I'll let it go back to the beginning, where it's searching. So he, you can see it searches lots of different areas in Lancashire, They're quite big areas. And quickly for this example, it finds an area in the north of Blackburn and it really zooms in and finds a very small area. And so this gives some really useful information for environmental health teams and public health teams to think about what's in the center of that. It could be a primary school, it could be a pub, it could be a church, something like that. Um, and so that's that's the method we used for the final thing. Um, so obviously, once this is run, uh, we want it. We want to then find the second highest place. And so you then remove we remove all these cases and just run the algorithm again. Do that lots of times until we've got lots of points on the map or areas on the map, and that will show the highest, like most risky places uh, to be. And here's just a little, another little example of how this is linked. Um, again, using Plumber, we just have it so that it runs automatically whenever we get the new data. Um, and then it's saved in a database. And then we can just feed that through to the front end. And so the user can go on and they can just see for the latest dates. Um, you can see like where the cases are happening, where's the highest region, and you can also change if you're obviously in a council that doesn't have that many cases, but you're so interested to see where the worst places for you are, how you can scale that up to highlight the lowest, lower regions. So that's that's basically it. They're the four um, methods we've used. Um, so just looking at points and crude rates are very simple. So they're really good and quite useful, um, but they're quite hard to see in terms of significance um, and they can be very noisy. Uh, so the two more sophisticated methods we've used, both using R, uh, they're really good at honing on regions. And scan statistics shows a very uh, significant region, and genetic algorithm shows a very small region. But also they're very complex, and so we thought by using all four methods we could try and fix that a little bit. And yeah, that's basically. Great, thank you, Ben. That looks like a wonderful piece of work. That really does. Uh, we've got comments in the chat like wow <laughs> um can we um is there a link to this somewhere that people can access it not at the moment we're planning on making an open source version because we've got obviously we need to remove all the data um, and then we'll stick that up on probably a, we have a gitlab uh, which is open we've had a, a couple of questions come in so i'm just going to go through those whilst we've got a little bit of time but we'll have to move on to the next speaker very shortly so um our first one is was the isochrome travel time based on car driving or public transport or both it was based on walking distance so we're trying to find really small regions so that's why we we were thinking about primary schools or local pubs um and then driving would be a lot harder because if people are driving to work then it could be massive so yeah just walking do you know how this information is being used by the local council or public health to target interventions or communications? Uh, so we know that um, there are some environmental health teams and um, that are using it for leaflet drops, that kind of thing. And then the public health team are using it for, they, I think they check, well, not to put words in mouth, but I think they check every week or every day just to see where the most risky places are, that kind of thing. We've got a couple more, but we'll put them in the chat because we do need to move on to our next speaker. Um, so thanks so much for your time, Ben. That was a really good piece of work. And um, if you just pay attention to the chat, I think there's going to be a couple of questions appear for you in yeah, there just yeah. while I introduce the next speaker. So we've got Adam Brain, who's an anaesthesia core trainee from Northern Devon Healthcare, NHS Trust. 
on the line, hopefully. And they're going to be talking to us about applying web scraping and natural language processing to analyze BMJ obituaries uh, between 1997 and 2019. Okay, hello. Um, Hi, Adam. So, hello. so you'll get seven uh, minutes and then I'll gently interrupt you when there's two minutes time as gently as I can. <laughs> Over to you. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Adam Brain. I'm an anaesthetic doctor in the Southwest, um, but this project um, I've done in my own time with my brother Ralph, who's a data scientist, and Alex, who's a PhD um, student and intensive care doctor in London. Um, uh, my interest in R comes from um, about 10 years ago when I was an undergraduate, I worked on viral evolution models um, in R, and now I don't use it for that, but I use it for um, lots of data analysis and data visualization. Um, so, the aim of this project um, is to see whether we could get the data that's um, held in the BMJ obituaries, uh, which they publish of doctors every single um, month, and see if we can get that data um, and make some sense of it. So there's thousands and thousands of these obituaries. Um, so we see if we can scrape that data off um, from their website, because um, they've been publishing them online since 1997. So there's loads of data there. Um, so it's more, it's a bit of a moonshot to see whether we could do it. And it turned out to be quite fun and take quite a long time um, as these things do. So um, I've mocked up a, an obituary here so you can see what it um, looks like. Um, so this isn't a real person, but you can see this. So this is an HTML um, and the, this is a typical web page. And there are over 8,000 of these that we needed to scrape. Um, and so it's got the, the person's name and then um, just here a bit of text about them which contains quite a lot of information, um, but not written or not recorded in a particularly um, useful way for our um, scraping. Um, obviously, obituaries weren't written to be a data repository. They're written as a, a record and a memory. Um, and so um, it's an interesting challenge to firstly scrape this um, data off the website in the first place, and then secondly, try and analyze it and make some sense of it. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, so, some work has been done on this previously. This was all done manually. Um, so, um, these two papers um, with first of all 500 and then 3,000 um, obituaries um, used an army of medical students um, um, working away to try and um, manually extract these variables. So, we wanted to try and avoid that and try and automate it, see if it's possible. Um, so, web scraping. Um, it's essentially trying to get um, data off web pages and the most simple form of that would just be copy and pasting. So um, that, that would just be a manual way of um, web scraping. And I think Joe, the speaker before last, was saying how much he hates copy and pasting. I hate it too. And so that was off the cards. Um, the next um, most labor intensive thing is HTML parsing. So that's um, stripping off the HTML and then using tags within the HTML, the structure of the HTML, to pull out the variables you're interested in. That's what we did. There is an easier option, which is API, which automated program interface, and that's um, where the website itself helps you to, to pull the data off. Um, and I've got an example of that coming up now because um, I messed around with Twitter, this package on R called TwitR. Um, it's so easy to do. It's, it, takes maybe less than an hour to, to do some meaningful scraping. Um, so you can see this code, I've had to hash out the actual functions because they wouldn't run in Markdown because um, I had to truncate the passwords because uh, they're meant to be secret. So, um, but you can see what I did. So the bottom line there is showing you you're searching for a hashtag med Twitter, shows you the, the previous 50,000 tweets in English um, and that will just spit them all out. Um, into a data frame and you can do what you want with it. Um, it wasn't particularly interesting that one, but um, you can look at um, coronavirus or Trump or anything you want that's um, topical. So that's very easy to do. That's an API. Unfortunately, the um, BMJ web page that we're scraping doesn't have an API. So you have to go in um, and get it from the HTML. So there's a um, R package called RVest that helps you do that. And that will um, loop through the pages that you want it to and strip out the HTML, and then um, you need to write something that will pick out the ID um, tag um, of interest, because there's a lot of gumph on here. So I'm gonna, hopefully you'll be able to see this. If I inspect this, um, I'm gonna show you how to find out um, what, what tag you want to look for. 
So if you go to the inspect um, function and you pick up the paragraph that you want, um, expand this out, check it to what you want. So this is actually where the meat of the um, of the HTML is. It's all in here. Um, and you can see it's got this ID tag, ID equals P-1. So that's what we um, what, that's what we use to identify um, the data that we wanted. Um, so once we've got that, so we've got a CSV or a data frame full of that um, those those paragraphs. Um, that's the scraping bit done. We need to extract some variables from it. That's really challenging in a big lump of prose, like I showed you. Um, so some techniques um, that we use, um, it's a very brief overview, but um, we use stemming and lemmatizations, which is a way of making words back to their roots. Um, so for um, lemmatization, the, the, the word studying would become study. Um, that just helps to make sense of words with suffixes on them. Um, repetitive phrases were particularly helpful in our case. So for example, died from an obituary is often followed by the cause of death. Um, leaves behind is often um, uh, followed by children or uh, partners and things like that. Um, so that's the um, tools in R include Corpus and Quantata. Um, so what do we find out? Um, I won't go through all of this, but we got over 8,000 obituaries um, but in that 22 year period. Um, and we got some interesting um, stats that are, are, gonna, are the subject of a paper um, that's um, under review at the moment. Um, one thing I wanted to flag, because it, it is particularly relevant to R, um, is that we use a package called RelServe, which is a really brilliant package um, by Dr. Pohar, um, who um, it helps you look at the relative survival benefit or, or disadvantage of certain states. So we compared to um, that our cohorts are that of the general UK population and showed that um, those in our cohort, so most likely uh, their doctors in the BMJ obituary, um, had a um, increased relative survival ratio, so they're more likely to, to um, live longer. Um, and you can see on the panel B, that's stratified by specialism. So you can see that all of them there um, have a, this relative survival benefit apart from the emergency medics um, who are um, underneath one. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into why that might be. It might not be a true effect. That, that may be an artifact. Um, so web scraping, natural language processing, um, that's how we did it. it, it um, we, set out, we achieved what we set out to do. It's uh, um, really tricky to extract some of these variables. Um, so really simple things, you know, year of publication and gender, uh, they're extremely easy to automate. So 100% never got it wrong. Our, our algorithm nailed it. Cause of death. So why this person died um, is something we we're interested in. Really hard to pull out accurately. Um, but um, uh, we did reasonably well. Um, but um, you see 10% of cases, it would have assigned um, something, some nonsense variable to that to that variable so um, rather than the um, actual thing but in over 50 percent of cases it was there and in the rest of cases it, it, it wasn't reported so um, that's no way of avoiding that so take home messages from this there's lots of quality data out there and it's under analyzed it's underutilized it's sitting waiting to be um, interesting things to be found web scraping is easy and achievable you can make these data accessible um, it's there's really the simple stuff that I've showed you, natural language processing, that's really accurate for simple things. Um, uh, machine learning is probably going to be the way if, if, if we really wanted to um, analyze those causes of death and get better stats than that, better um, accuracies, then it would be a machine learning approach. Um, and um, But at the end of all of this, we've ended up with the largest ever um, reported um, study of its kind, and um, hopefully it's going to make a good paper when it's published. Um, so I'd like to say thank you to BMJ and R and all associated packages. Those papers are the papers I talked about. And does anyone have any questions? Well, any quick questions for Adam before we have to quickly move on to Zoe because we're running out of time a little bit. I can't see any questions for you at the moment, Adam. Um, can I just quickly ask, have you plans to look at other journals and injuries using this? Um, so the um, no, not at the moment. Um, <laughs> but if anyone knows of, um, I don't think many other journals do obituaries in the same way. Um, but um, if you've got if, to look at nursing staff and things like that. Well, no, the, the nursing journals they don't do them in, in quite the same way. Uh, but if anyone knows otherwise, please let me know. 
there, there is a question in ch uh, that's come up, but I'll put it in the chat because we need to move on to Zoe. No um, so Zoe, Zoe's our next speaker. Thank you very much, Adam. If people could show their appreciation in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. So Zoe Turner, who's a senior information analyst at Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. And she's going to be talking to us about why do I need to learn R when I can use SQL? Have we got Zoe on the line? Yes, I should be there. Great, I can hear you. I'm just trying to share my screen, I think, because I is that showing my it, screen? It's sharing the separate panel, but if I get out of the way, it might get bigger. Oh, I'm big. There we go. Okay, I'll just voice <laughs> through. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking today about why we should use R and maybe not SQL as we tend to do. So if you just bear with me. The reason why I want to talk about this is because I started learning R about two years ago and I learned SQL before that. I've used it for a number of years. Lots of analysts only really have that tool for analysis. So we can do quite amazing things in it. And when we were doing some training, I was helping with it. One of my co-colleagues came up to me and said, why do I need to learn R? Because everything I've learned today using Dplyr, which is part of the training that we get through NHSR, I can do in SQL, why do I need R? And at the time I really couldn't answer that question because I really still did use a lot of R. I kind of immediately dropped Excel, but I was using a lot of SQL. So I don't, I mean, at that point, and possibly for some people now, so what's all the fuss about? So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. As I said, I'm just gonna set this off so you can see some movement of code. I used SQL for some amazing things in analysis, and this is code for statistical process control charts from NHS Improvement. And I was really impressed by this code because it's it's a lot in there, but it's really long, as you can see, it's kind of still going and still going. And there's a lot to debug, decode in there, not that there's any bugs, but if you're trying to use that for your own work, that, that's quite a long piece of code to get through, to understand, to break down. And I've never used it because it's it's just really long. I have used this. This is a package called QI Charts 2, but there are a couple of other packages by a fellow NHSR community member who's created a couple of packages for himself in Scotland, John McIntosh. And there's very few lines in it because beneath that code, there's some more code, it's dplyr and ggplot. And beneath that, you've got base R. So it's piled upon pile of coding that other people have done, worked on, debugged, continue to debug, which we don't really get with SQL. One line of code, which I've highlighted here, means that you get tiny charts repeated. So you don't have to keep repeating it over and over and over again. Facet is an amazing line of code. But this talk really shouldn't be about charts because SQL isn't a charting software program. It's about relational databases. So to look at the data, I did some dummy code data. And I've, never, I've worked for a number of years in SQL and with SQL, but I've never created dummy data before because there's no culture around SQL for necessarily creating it, and certainly not for analysts where I've been working. It took about 76 lines of code. It took me about a day to do at home. Uh, I was determined to do it. The code is available. I'm going to share it in my GitHub. Um, and it, the, the bit that was really crucial to me, because the, the lines of code is one thing and the, the time it takes, well, that's another. But it took a server to run it. So it was a paid package to run it. And I also needed the hardware to run it from. Contrast that to R, which is where I think R kind of wins on this, is that I used R and R Studio, which is free, on my existing hardware, which is my laptop. It took 25 lines of code. I've not been learning R for a long time, and yet I could just fake data really quickly because being a statistical package, it's built upon creating random numbers. And for this, I created some random dates, for example. Another verb that I think takes your analysis a little bit a step further from SQL, although you can do it in SQL, is to fill down. So this is kind of like an example. This actually came from a Stack Overflow SQL question where the idea is that customer one, their last value was 12. If you were in Excel, you would like click on it, point down, fill down, and you drag it down. You can't do that for hundreds and hundreds of people, but there is code available, about 34 lines of SQL code to fill in where you've got the details on one line and you just want all the rest to be the same. Contrast that to R, 
where there is one line of code, which I've managed to get a GIF in to fill in the rest of the space. It's amazing. You can fill up, you can fill down, up, down. It, it's flexible and it's trustworthy and very quick. But I might not have convinced you yet, particularly if you were like me and used SQL for nearly a decade. Let's see if I can convince you with two words, pivot tables. Now, I want to get, and this happens quite frequently, we've got long data, which we have in our SQL databases, and people like it one row per person, and I want the, the services in columns next to it. So I'm going from something called long data to wide data, which is on the right. If I look at the SQL, you can hard code it, but the problem is once it's hard coded, thank you, you can't go back to your original data as easily, say, as you could do with Excel, where you could just look for the, the data that builds up your numbers. You can do it with joins, uh, but it's really long and very verbose. I've only been able to fit two examples on there, not three, because it's really long and it didn't fit on my screen very well. Case when is really efficient and concise, and that's what I've been using more frequently, where I use the binary max with case when. But if I look at our code, there's a new, it, it did exist as a different kind of uh, function name. It was called gather and spread, but now they're called pivot wider and pivot longer. It's a function within R, which is in dplyr specifically, sorry, tidy R, which is specific. Three lines of code, and then you can just get your wide code. But what's really nice is that you can flip between the two. So when you're doing your analysis, sometimes you want it to be long to do something to it, and then wide to get it back out again, and then long again, which I have done. So it's taken my analysis to a new level without cumbersome data that's fixed that I have to maintain with SQL. And that is the reason why I think for analysis, certainly you should be using more R, but for SQL, for doing the hard lifting of stuff, definitely keep to that. Just so that everybody can see, I've got the dummy data from SQL available with the R data, but it was just as an example. And that's the end of my uh, presentation, but I would like to give considerable thanks to two workshop attendees from last week, which was Sylvia, who gave me the Sharingham um, sort of the background to this and the code to create. This was all done in our markdown. That's something that SQL can't do, but I wasn't really kind of comparing the two there. And Simon also gave me the code for putting GIFs into my uh, presentation, which made it moving, which is wonderful. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Zoe. We've had comments like you had me at pivot from Richard there in the chat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I showed my husband. It looks like you convinced somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of applause for, for Zoe there. Lovely presentation. Has anyone got any questions for Zoe? We do still have the ask question function at the bottom of the screen. I can't see any questions. I can't see any questions. I think it's very really well done. Zoe. I just saw. Yes, if anyone code, thinks of anything, I'm sure you can contact Zoe. Yeah, um, my code is on, on the screen. My code is on GitHub, and I'm going I, to try yeah. and render it like Sylvia has on her GitHub, so that you can actually see the slides rendered. Lovely. Okay. Thank you very much for everyone that's joined us this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed a really wonderful whirlwind of a session. We've had many topics and lots of places I'm now going to go to see where we can improve how we work more efficiently and investigate a few things that, that people have talked about today. Um, don't forget to join everybody tomorrow for the session. Anastasia, what time does it start tomorrow? Uh, thank you, Stacey. I just wanted to um, actually possibly even share my screen and talk about... Oh, OK. I'll get out the way then. Uh, no worries. Um, so just to let everyone know um, that we are going to uh, have one more day tomorrow as usually. I'm just focusing it. Um, so we have uh, uh, our session starts quarter past nine. Um, as today, um, we will have session from Health Foundation uh, about uh, Health Foundation and analytics and how they support uh, work across the UK. We will hear about causal inference from uh, Andy Arlovsky and uh, Bruna uh, Jungara. Uh, we will also hear from our colleagues in Wales 
uh, about how they uh, supported planning during COVID crisis. Uh, we will hear about Gplot Polygon from our colleagues from Norway, uh, and we will also um, speak about our shiny transformation and uh, how ONS uh, Data Science Campus uh, is working. So please join us. Uh, you can also join us for early bird coffee morning. Uh, you should all have a link in your delegate information, hopefully. And we will also have lightning talk session, uh, same time, same place. Uh, we hope we'll see you there. Thank you. And uh, yes, thank you to Stacey as well for doing an amazing job today, uh, facilitating all the questions. Uh, I think Stacey, you're on mute. <laughs> you can't see what the audience is is reacting so well done to all of them for doing a brilliant job today it's great yes thank you to all our speakers and uh, here i think it's the end of our lightning talk session number one and we will see you tomorrow goodbye <laughs>